how long did it take before, you know, once L. Ron Hubbard died and Miscavige <clears throat> became known as this leader? And, and how did you become like his right hand man or like the head of that special affairs organ part of the company or part of the organization? Well, it's sort of a long story, but the, the, the beginning of it is that I was chosen by Miscavige to participate in what was a series of actions to dismantle what was called the Guardian's Office. And the Guardian's Office was the precursor to the Office of Special Affairs. Okay, and that Guardian's Office was set up by Hubbard? By Hubbard, okay. and his wife, Mary Sue Hubbard, was the head of the Guardian's office. Okay. And I told you earlier about this raid that the FBI did in 1977 and all those documents. The, the result of that was the, the federal government prosecuted Mary Sue Hubbard and 10 other leaders of the Guardian's office. They ultimately pled guilty and all went to federal prison for infiltrating the government, for stealing documents from the government, for bugging the offices of the IRS and the DOJ. And, I mean, it was a massive, massive operation, the largest infiltration and spying operation ever against the United States government. And the ultimate outcome of that was that Hubbard decreed that the Guardian's office, including his wife, had been traitors and that they had, you know, messed up so badly that they had to all be gotten rid of. Mm -hmm. And so it was put in, you know, on the plate of Miscavige to do that. And where was Hubbard during all this? He was hiding. Hiding? Yeah, literally. <laughs> He sort of bunker, disappeared in the middle of the night. He drove off in a car with two people from La Quinta. Originally, he went to Reno, Nevada and lived in a motel. And then when things seemed to be safe, he sort of came back and lived in Hammett, which is near the, the Golden Era Productions property, which became the international sort of headquarters of Scientology in Riverside County, California. Mm -hmm. But then when things heated up there and he thought that he was going to be subpoenaed or someone was going to catch him, mm -hmm. um, he went first to Newport Beach and he drove around in a Bluebird bus motorhome for a a whole bunch of time traveling around incognito and then bought a ranch near Creston, California, which is north of Santa Barbara. Okay. And lived under an assumed name with a long beard and long hair there for until he died. Wow. Miscavige, meanwhile, had, you know, we had gone and, uh, disbanded the Guardian's office, but as I said, replaced it with the Office of Special Affairs. And that was in 1981. And because of my participation in that, I ended up sort of moving into the Office of Special Affairs and then rising in the ranks of the Office of Special Affairs until I became the head of it. Okay. So this is so crazy. H how does it feel to you now, I mean, you were once a head of special affairs, which was in charge of dealing with people like who you are right now. Mm -hmm. So you're considered right now, you are considered one of the biggest threats to Scientology. Is that oh, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> devote a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of private investigators, a lot of uh, websites, a lot of smear campaigns to me and Leah Remini. We're like number one and two on the hit parade of Scientology. And um, so how does, I mean, knowing what, you know, yeah. because you were the head of that and you obviously saw everything that went on and like the top tier of the organization, as far as handling people like yourself, um, how does that make you feel now being one of the, no the number one people who are outspoken about this? Um, well, honestly, I feel like I have a responsibility to do it. 
I feel like I have a responsibility to all the people who have been abused by Scientology and will continue to be abused by Scientology. Um, I feel like, you know, there probably isn't anybody else in the world who has the insight and the knowledge that I have to be able to dissect what happens and expose the truth about what really is going on. Mm -hmm. You know, that is coupled with the, you know, how the hell did I not, how the hell did I not get this? Why did it take so long? Right. Like, I'm not, um, I'm not stupid, but I was for a very long time. And this is what is so, um, so sinister about Scientology is ultimately if, if you walk down to the, the spiritual headquarters of Scientology in Clearwater there and spoke to those Scientologists, you would find generally that they are nice people. Right. They're not wackos. They're not like, you know, spouting crazy, standing on a street corner, right. the world is ending with hang holding signs. They're like normal people that live sort of apparently normal lives. But if you poke around in into their how they view the world, they have a very distorted view of of the world and and they will do things that one wouldn't imagine that you could get someone like that to do it with the idea that it is helping or protecting Scientology. And if you can convince someone that Scientology is the answer to man's problems and the only hope for mankind and the only path to spiritual freedom, people will do things that you wouldn't expect that they would be willing to do in order to protect that. And Scientologists, you know, that's why Larry Wright, his brilliant book, Going Clear, is subtitled Scientology, The Prison of Belief. Mm -hmm. because it's a mind prison it it you get sucked in with the good ideas and what are apparently the good intentions of Scientology and gradually start to believe this twisted world view that there is an evil conspiracy of psychiatry and medical doctors and big pharma and governments who are seeking to control and enslave mankind and that the only hope for mankind is Scientology. And if you ask any one of those normal looking people walking down the street in Clearwater, yeah. whether what they just say the word to them, listen, uh, tell me about psychiatry you will get a blithering idiot rant from them about psychiatry or the enemies of mankind. They're destroying people. They're, they're electric shocking them. They're doing prefrontal lobotomies. They're sticking ice picks in their eyeballs. They're doing this. They're doing that. Like this is the, the us versus them mentality that is absolutely hammered in to every Scientologist in the world. And, People like me or reporters for the St. Pete Times, you know, now Tracy McManus, we're all, if not just as evil, we are the tools of the evil. We have become the, you know, Satan's, Satan's bag men who are doing the work of, psychiatry and big pharma to seek to eradicate Scientology because Scientology is the only effective uh, foil against their evil. 
And if you, if you, Danny, if you go look, you will see Scientology has said that I'm being paid by Big Pharma. I'm a spokesperson for the psychiatry, for psychiatry. Leah Remini and like anybody is this. And this is the, the crazy mindset that lies just beneath the social veneer of the normal looking Scientology people.